one of the great arguments against the a idea that there is a God that uh, was shared with us at college was that uh, it was the expression of man's desire for a father figure. And uh, that's all the belief in God really was. It was just wishful thinking. And, uh, of course, uh, that kind of comes round the back of you and uh, has the appearance of uh, a kind of esoteric insight and uh, an inside knowledge and uh, uh, reasoning below the usual level of thinking that people do. And so it impresses you at first. And you think, yeah, maybe that is what the belief in God is. It's just a sublimation of our desire for a father figure. Of course, if you come around from the other angle entirely, uh, the uh, fallacy of the whole argument is exposed. Because if there is, in fact, a God, and if, in fact, he is a a father-like figure, and if, in fact, we owe to him all our existence and everything we have and our ability to see and hear, and if, in fact, he has made us so that we can be his children and so that we can be his friends and so that we can enjoy his company and he can enjoy our company, then it is very reasonable that we will have within us a sense that we have a father and that we ought to depend on him and that we ought to love him. And we will have a feeling of need for a father figure. In other words, it's a bit like coming to a a child who wants to jump into his father's arms and saying to him, no, don't jump, don't jump. That's just a sublimation of your desire for a father figure in your life. And a little kid wouldn't have the sense to say it, but if he had, he would say, You know why that is? (laughs) That's because I have a father. I have a father, and I am his child. And that's why I feel the need for a father figure, because I have a father that loves me, and I've been made for him. And I've been, uh, I come into existence so that I could enjoy his friendship and so that he could enjoy mine. So naturally, there's a sense of need inside. So because the need is there, uh, it's evidence that uh, there is an answer to that need. And so, of course, you soon begin to see those old chestnuts that we tried to feed ourselves with at the university and at school when we were younger, uh, that uh, they are just old chestnuts. They're just old uh, explanations of uh, a cynical attitude that we want to take towards reality. And it's an expression, really, of our desire to be on our own. And, of course, that's what we've been sharing in this broadcast over the past weeks, that we do actually have an intelligent mind behind this universe. That's the explanation of the order and design that we see in it. And that intelligent mind expressed himself in a remarkable man that lived about 1960 years ago here on our planet called Jesus of Nazareth. And that he explained to us, you have a father. My my father is the creator of the universe. And he actually made you because he wants you to share his friendship and his love. And that's why you exist, and that's why he gave you all the presents he's given you, your ability to see and hear and think. That's why he's given you these things. And what we shared yesterday was, of course, that we have rejected that idea. We don't like it. We haven't wanted to be dependent on him for his thoughts and his guidance for us in our life. We've wanted to live our own life for our own sakes. And the result is we've felt a great need, a great lack in our lives. And the lack is, of course, his love. We were made for his love, and we have a great need for that love. And when we refuse to believe in him or refuse to have any attitude of trust towards him, there's a great emptiness comes into our lives. And actually, all of us feel that. I mean, you feel it yourself, don't you? You feel that you were really made for the kind of heavenly experience that is found in a cross between the Arabian Nights and Walden Pond. You feel you were made for that combination of peace, solid peace, 
and exhilarating excitement. You feel you were made for stability and security. The security of having a million dollars or a million pounds at your disposal, and yet the security of having someone who looks after you all the time. That's what where we felt so uh, much sympathy with Eliza, you remember, Eliza Doolittle in uh, uh, My Fair Lady, when she talked about all she wanted was uh, uh, chocolates and uh, comfort and a sense of being at home. That's where we felt uh, so close to our father when he talked about opening up the castle at Capri. Uh, we always dream of a place of security and stability uh, like uh, the rich we imagine have, and we always feel we are made for that. Well, it's because we were made for it. But it's made not for those individual things, but for the love of the infinite creator of the universe who with his love is able to give us all those things now of course we feel now the need of that love and we feel not only the need of it but we feel the need of the things that that love gives us and of course we determine we must find it elsewhere and that's what we have really done most of us have tried to find it in the world itself in the world of people the world of things, the world of circumstances. We try to find in that the characteristics of the love that the Creator has for us, and we try to make up for it by getting it from the world of men and things and circumstances and events. So we uh, feel a great need of uh, significance. You know, we look around and we say, oh, five billion others in this world... And I'm only one of five billion, and yet I do feel I'm unique. I feel I'm different from everybody else. But for some reason, none of the rest seem to notice that I'm different. And the funny thing is, the whole five billion of us are saying that. We're all saying, I feel I'm unique. And actually, you are unique. There's nobody like you in the whole universe. But we feel, I'm unique. There's nobody like me. And yet, none of the rest seem to notice that there's nobody like me. And of course, that's because all the rest are thinking the same thing. And so we start trying to get the rest to notice how unique we are because we feel that that is what we need. If we could only get somebody to notice us and notice how unique we are and how different we are, then maybe we could fill that sense of emptiness that we have deep down in our hearts. And it's really a, a need for the love of the Creator. But we can't identify that because we've given up believing in God and all that stuff. And so we think if we could only get people to think and value us as we really are, that would maybe give us some sense of fullness in our lives that we feel we need. And so we go to it. You know we do. We dream from where little kids of being Hobbelong Cassidy or Jean Autry who gets the girl or we dream of being some wonderful prince or king, or later on when we get out of uh, grade school or primary school and we get into high school or grammar school or comprehensive school, we begin to think maybe we can be somebody. Maybe we can be somebody. Maybe we can be a Murdoch. Maybe we can be uh, somebody important. We can't be, obviously, the king or the prince or the uh, lady, Diane, but maybe we can be somebody worth something. And so we begin to work to try to get people to notice how unique and how different we are. And you know the kind of clownish activities that that puts us into, how we suffer in sports and suffer in academics, how we struggle with our appearance, how we try to buy the coolest looking clothing that we can get our hands on, how we try to get the most unique haircut that we can find, how we will dye our hair and stick pins in our cheeks. We'll do anything. We'll put earrings in our nose. We'll make ourselves dumb and stupid looking. If only somebody will notice us. Please, somebody notice Notice me. Somebody appreciate that I'm different. And so we get into the most hideous antics in order to try to get the sense of uniqueness that the love of the Creator alone gives us. And that's the kind of life that many of us live in these days. Let's talk a little more tomorrow about some of these things because we're all in the same boat, you know. That's one advantage we have. We can sympathize with each other because we're all doing the same thing. Let's talk a little more tomorrow.